All right, I will try and get us uh, back on time. I'm going to finish at 2 o'clock. This is a boring talk. Okay, so uh, uh, everybody likes to talk about all sorts of sexy things like sharding and other buzzwords. I'm not saying that these things are not worth doing because they are, and, and uh, the people who have developed these architectures have done so out of necessity, but they're not the only way to do it, and for most users, um, if, you, if you build a little bit smarter, you can avoid these things. Um, and, and the reason you might want to avoid them is that sharding, for example, sharding in particular, um, introduces a lot of extra complexity into your architecture. A lot, it, it takes rock star developers, it takes uh, sometimes asking for consulting help, for example. Um, and uh, if you can get away without doing it, it's, it's much better not to. So what I want to talk about here is the, the mythical average user. There's no such thing as average user, but I'm envisioning that a shop built with uh, you know, a few tens of thousands of dollars of total hardware and software costs for the whole system, um, with a couple of people who are smart uh, wearing all the hats in the, in the place. Um, that, that's my sort of mythical average, average shop here that I'm targeting this talk at. So the context for this is actually my, my last job prior to joining Percona. Um, and I, I will just, a slight disclaimer here, it was eventually sharded, but I do mean eventually. We, we pushed it really, really, really far. And we pushed it really far probably in, in some ways that might not have made economic sense. For example, uh, we strung ourselves out on cheap disks and on RAID 5 for a really long time. And as far as I know, it's still running on just like uh, servers with three RAID 5 disks. We could probably have gotten a better price performance ratio um, than doing that. But um, we were hitting the wall where most people would have said sharding is inevitable uh, when I joined the company. Two years later, uh, as I left the company, we sharded. So uh, uh, my last little point on here is that I have currently a client in, at, at Percona. We have many clients who, who don't always take our advice. And this particular one that I'm thinking of has a very similar application to the one that I, I helped develop at my last real job. And um, they're, they're running with easily 10 times more hardware, probably, probably 100 times more money, a whole bunch of people. Uh, it, it's, it, it, and it's a small application. It's probably got... The, the data size on disk that they have is less than a tenth of the size of, of what I was working at in, in my previous employment. And if we had not done some of the techniques that I will talk about, it, we probably, in my previous employment, would have been maybe a thousand times as much data as, as this particular customer of mine is using. So they've got a small application, and they've gone the enterprise route, and it's turned into a gargantuan application that I think is much more expensive than it needs to be. If they're listening to me and they figure out who they are, well, I hope not. <laughs> well, we've, we've told them this to their faces. So. Anyway, so why would you need to shard? Before I go on to the boring stuff, let me just get this out of the way. You usually shard when you can't scale yourself any other way. And there are lots and lots of ways to scale reads, but there are very few ways to scale writes. In fact, writes have to be done in all parts of the system that you want to have the same data, unless you're doing something magical. So. I.O. Uh, uh, writes usually end up being the point around which you have to shard. Okay, so my techniques. Um, the first technique for building, uh, for, for making a large application much smaller than you might think it has to be is to measure things. That way you know where to direct your efforts. Um, you want to get monitoring and trending. Monitoring in particular is not, uh, not going to make your large application smaller, but it's going to help you in, in many, many ways. And trending is, uh, is one way of gathering metrics. You need to measure everything. Um, and it, who was here for Carrie Millsap's talk this morning? Any hands? Good. Um, those are the kinds of things that you need to measure. Uh, graphing and, and monitoring with Cacti and Nagios is, is one way of getting some metrics. But you really need to figure out those business metrics, and you really need to look at instrumenting your code so that you can get the, the, the types of timing and profiling information that's usable that Carrie Millsap was talking about. <coughs> Um, the next thing to do is actually high-level architectural analysis. You look at your system and you ask, where am I spending the money here? Um, am I throwing a whole bunch of money at disks, for example? Am I throwing a whole bunch of money at cheap servers? I I've gone the route of, of working with a company that sort of tried the Google thing. When, you know, the, there's another common misperception that Google runs, I don't know, maybe Dell Dimension 1100 work, workstation computers from 10 years ago, and they're running a whole search cluster on that. Um, 
the people I was working with took that literally, and we ran the shop on Dell Dimension 1100 with <laughs> 128 megs of RAM and a single IDE hard drive. <laughs> Um, and when we really looked at it, we, we were actually spending more money there than if we had bought some, some uh, a little bit more commodity servers. So when people say commodity, scaling out by commodity is good, but commodity does not necessarily mean cheap. So what, what you want to look at is where are you spending your time, where are you spending your money, which parts of your application need the most engineering talent, um, what's hardest to replace, what's most likely to fail, those kinds of things. And you also want to look at the good things. In particular, which parts of your, of your application just work and you never have to think about it? And here's another fun thing. You know those little um, Linksys routers that you can buy for your home? That's like the wireless router. We ran the business on one of those for a long time. It's like a $45 component, and, uh, and it worked really well. Ultimately, it failed. But, um, but it, it worked really well for a long time. When you're doing this calculation, just bring up a spreadsheet. It's really easy to just throw some columns together. I don't have a demo here because I just put these slides together. But um, it's really easy to just to just do some back of the napkin math and, and uh, facilitate that with spreadsheets. Um, and, and you want to do that all through the code and try and figure out where you're, where you're actually spending money and time in the code, too. The database is really important to profile. Uh, it's, it's difficult to profile my, MySQL. There's some efforts underway to, to make that easier. but at the moment, it's very difficult to figure out where, where your queries are actually spending time. And, um, and this goes back to what Carrie said this morning also. You want to look at what the user experience is. In the application that I'm referring to in this talk, the user, quote unquote user, was a whole bunch of uh, robots, you could think of it that way. A whole bunch of cron jobs and, and, and periodic tasks like that. There were no direct users. This was not a web application. Um, this was much more like a traditional enterprise application with a very high workload. Um, but you had to look at the, the experience and the requirements of your Perl scripts that were the ultimate end users of the system. If, uh, at Chrono, we do a lot with web shops, and so, of course, the user is very easy to identify. And you can emulate the user very quickly by opening your web browser and going to your client's website. There's a reason that the bleeding edge is called the bleeding edge. Um, and the people who build and use uh, the, the bleeding edge are doing so because they're forced to. Uh, Don McCaskill is not running ExtraDB for fun. We're not building ExtraDB for fun. We're doing it because there's a real need for it. Most people are not going to have to run uh, beta software to get radical improvements in, in their price to performance ratio. Uh, there's also a lot of stuff out there that might just be brittle or incomplete, and that can be really costly. So I'm not advocating that you stay with stodgy old things that come from a long time ago and were buggy then, and they're still buggy now, and there's a new version now that's just as buggy. Um, just because it's older doesn't mean that it's better, but just because it's new and flashy doesn't also mean that, that um, there's not some risk in running it. There's safety in numbers, and there's, there's safety in staying with what lots and lots of people have tested and proven. Nine minutes. Um, so I, talk, I talked before about commodities, so I think I can just uh, skip this one. Except for saying, um, when, when I'm talking about non-commodity hardware, we're talking about large proprietary systems that um, are not interchangeable with each other. So the first secret uh, to the last two corporations that I've worked at is to archive and purge old data. And this is one of the most difficult things that we've done. Not only from a technical perspective, because it's a significant e effort to, to figure out which data can be gotten rid of, which data can be moved away to slower storage or just burn to DVD or something like that. But it's a significant political effort because you've got your pointy-haired boss who doesn't want to give up his, you know, I might someday want to write that report end over, you know, year over year to, to see what was going on in, like, 1995. Well, are 1995's metrics really relevant to today? No. Write the report, run it once, save the spreadsheet throw away the data that the spreadsheet was used to, uh, was built from. This is actually very difficult, and even, even heavily technical users, such as the ones that I had at my last corporation, are pretty difficult to, to convince sometimes that they don't need the data or that it's just too expensive. Again, um, as with hardware, as with programmers or, or, or techniques or whatever else, data has a uh, price-to-performance ratio, a, a cost-to-benefit ratio, and you have to look at it. Is it really benefiting me to drive my business by looking that far in my rearview mirror? Probably not. 
So, um, so one technique, specific technique that I'll mention here is, for example, um, aggregating everything off after 90 days, keeping the aggregates for a year. So you have 90 days of daily data and then a year's worth of, of weekly and monthly data. And after a year, you, you move it off to another system entirely. Uh, after five years, you just throw it away, period. Um, hard problems are hard to solve, so don't solve them. Just go around them. There's a lot of inventive ways that you can do this if, uh, if, if you've got creative people. Um, for example, everybody wants real-time processing. Does everybody need real-time processing? Probably not. Do your processing in the middle of the night. If you have to have real-time data, sometimes you do. Um, let's say that your real-time data you're doing business intelligence over is over a six-month period. Do you have to do all six months of it real-time? Why don't you just do last night's processing up until midnight and then do real-time over midnight until now? Um, that's a much easier problem to solve. Um, Managers and, and uh, the end users of your data are often going to want real time. They're often going to want other features that they don't really need. You have to look at where the value really is for the business. Uh, and perfection is usually the enemy of good. There's also a, a persistent, not invented here syndrome mindset. Um, and I've had this myself. You know, I thought, wow, this is really different. I don't think anybody's actually done what I've done. Until I got to Perfection and I discovered that there's only really a finite uh, uh, class of problems. Um, these days when I get on the phone with a customer and they say, I don't know, they say something like, oh, I'm a hosted software as a service, um, multi-tenanting, and I go, stop right there. Because yeah. we've seen that before. And, and at my old job I thought, probably nobody's really doing what we're doing because we're doing it differently or something like that. The truth is, you've got a problem, everybody's got this problem. A couple of talks ago somebody was talking about efficiently paginating through data. Um, that's a really common problem. And everybody thinks, how am I going to solve this? And of course, they come up with the obvious answers that everybody else has already tried. And if the obvious answer is the best answer, then that's the end of the story. In many cases, the obvious answer is not the best answer. And so everybody ends up reinventing the same bad wheel over and over again. You can get help. Um, I'll mention one great resource for help. Get on the MySQL mailing list. You'd be surprised. There's a lot of really smart people there. Um, running to Google and typing in buffer pool size or something like that is, is almost guaranteed to give you bad results. <laughs> My gut feeling is that guesswork is a bad thing. That's supposed to be ironic. Um, I've, I've advocated putting profiling into your application. This is not a monumental task. This is simply a, 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 a task of identifying, well, to, to begin with, um, Almost every language actually has a built-in profiler. So with Perl, for example, you, you just add a command line and you run, uh, you, you add a command line argument and you run your script, and then you get profiling data. And the same thing is true for Ruby and Python and Java and many other languages. Uh, but you also need to profile your application, which means you need to find the specific points in your application where you're doing something. And there are two kinds of profiling that are interesting to do. One is to count how many times something happened, and the other is to, to time and, and uh, measure the resources consumed by that task from beginning to end. That's wall clock time, CPU time, user time. Um, some things you can't really uh, count the resources for other than time. For example, a network call, if you're, if you're calling out to a web service, all you can do is time that because you don't have any insight about what goes on inside of the, the, uh, the web service. The other secret to scaling MySQL is just to use something else instead. MySQL has strong points and has weak points. And a lot of common application paradigms land solidly in its weak points. And uh, you can hack and you can work around it, but it's often better to just use something different. I, I recently did some work for a content delivery network. And they have to track everything that goes in and out of their network because every time somebody's browser requests a file, it's money in their bank account. So they need to know this, and, and it's a hell of a lot of data coming in and out. Um, so they scaled with a combination of MySQL and Berkeley DB. I won't describe exactly how they did it, but it was brilliant. Um, they asked me to assess it, and my assessment after I came out of it was, wow, you guys have taught me a lot. Um, they used Berkeley DB, and I said, what about Tokyo Cabinet? A couple of days later, the guy comes back to me and goes, wow, this thing is blowing the doors off of Berkeley DB. And disclaimer, I haven't actually used Tokyo Cabinet myself. I just, I just heard of it, and I kind of thought, gee, I wonder. I just kind of sent that in an email to him. Um, that's a great client. 
Uh, the stuff can often be put on the file system. The most obvious thing here is storing your images on the file system instead of the database. But there's a lot of other things. A couple of applications ago, I worked in a, um, an all Microsoft shop. Things would come out of SQL Server and go into a specially formatted file on the file system. Every order went into its own file, and it went through this process of, uh, it looked very much Unix pipe and filterish. You know, it would get picked up from one place, stuff would get done, it would get put back somewhere else. Does this sound like a, 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 you know, a trustworthy, reliable, big finances are riding on this enterprise architecture? It worked great. Um, and, and a lot of times, solving problems with operating system tools instead of hard to scale expensive databases can be both more robust and easier to deal with and, and more effective than, than putting it into the database. If you're using MySQL, uh, just use the right storage engine. I, I won't go into that anymore. I won't have a lot of time to do that. Replication is great for scaling reads. Uh, not so good for, for uh, scaling writes. And um, keep your transactions small. If you are, for example, let's go back to that, that earlier example of running a report over the last six months of data. Why don't you run that one day at a time? Or even better, why don't you run it one day per client at a time? Or one day per client per account at a time? Keep those transactions really small, offload it to the slave, run it there, pipe the results back into the master, be friendly to replication. Uh, replication lag, I mean, there's, replication in MySQL is weaker than it is in some other databases. A replication lag and the cost of reproducing a write is inherent to replication. If you're going to replicate data, you're going to uh, change the data on every system so that it matches the master. There's no way to get around that. So what you want to do is make those changes as easy for the, the slaves to consume as you can. Um, and finally, I, I think this is finally, keep MySQL out of the critical path. Here's another common paradigm, click tracking or, or um, serving advertisements or something like that. Are you doing that out of a database? And if so, why? Because the database is the hardest to scale, least reliable, hardest to administer, most expensive to staff, most expensive to buy hardware for. This is a really expensive thing to do out of a database. So do your, do your ad serving out of something other than a database. Um, do your click tracking uh, to a file on the file system, and then pre-aggregate that and, and with, with Perl scripts or something, and then push the aggregate into the database rather than making the database do all the work. Benchmark anything that you pay money for. Otherwise, you can have a misconfiguration that can cost you big time. Um, skip this, and I'm right on time. Thanks. <laughs>